Hi everyone, welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library, I'm honored to introduce this virtual event with Kamran Vatha, presenting his new book, Puzzles to Unravel the Universe, with a special introduction by Harvard's own Melissa Franklin. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Coming up in the series on Tuesday, October 13th at 5 p.m., we'll host renowned neuroscientist Christoph Koch for his paperback release of the book, The Feeling of Life Itself, Why Consciousness is Widespread But Can't Be Computed, in conversation with Harvard Medical School professional Gabriel Kreiman. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter, or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. We also have a Science Research Public Lecture Series YouTube channel where you can view previous talks you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for Dr. Vatha at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Puzzles to Unravel the Universe on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you to all of you for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially of science, because it really, really matters. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few months, technical issues may arise, and if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. So now I'm excited to turn things over to my partner in the Harvard Science Book Talk series, renowned experimental particle physicist and Harvard physics professor, Melissa Franklin. The digital podium is all yours, Melissa. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we have something very ex exciting. I think it's very exciting. Uh, Kumran Vafa is my colleague in the physics department at Harvard. And I remember about 10 years ago, I think, uh, he decided to teach a freshman seminar. That's a, 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 a class for 12 students uh, who are freshmen on uh, puzzles. And I was very excited and I wanted to see the lecture notes, which he, he gave me. So I was able to read this book a long time ago. I think it's, but I read it again recently and it's even better. Interestingly enough, uh, so many people wanted to take this freshman seminar that in some years, uh, Kerman was teaching three groups of 12 students <laughs> every week, uh, which, is, which is pretty, you can tell that uh, people really, really liked it. Um, it's an interesting book because even if you don't like puzzles, it's really good. And that's strange because there's lots of scientists and lots of people who aren't puzzle people, but the puzzles in this book are so deep that it almost seems like they're not puzzles. But then again, for the puzzle people, it's even better. <laughs> So who is uh, Kumran Vafa? Kumran Vafa was born in Tehran and uh, went to high school there and then went and did his bachelor's degree in math and physics at MIT. Uh, then he went to Princeton and he worked with uh, his thesis advisor there for the PhD was Ed Witten, a famous, uh, very famous string theorist. Uh, and then uh, he came to Harvard uh, as a in the Society of Fellows as a junior fellow for three years. And straight from that, he was uh, asked to be a faculty member in the Harvard Physics Department. So uh, Kerman has been here for the past somewhat 25 <laughs> years <laughs> or so, 30 years, um, teaching uh, an excellent teacher in our department. And uh, at the same time, winning an enormous amount of prizes. So he works on quantum gravity, uh, you know, uh, we don't actually have a theory. Maybe I sh this is wrong, but I don't think we have a tested theory of quantum gravity um, yet and string theory. And he's very famous for, uh, with Andy Strominger, calculating the entropy of a black hole and for something called F theory. He has won the breakthrough prize twice, the baby one and the big one. And the Dirac medal, Dirac was the, uh, you know, very famous uh, theorist who uh, introduced antimatter. 
He won the Heinemann Prize. He's in the National Academy of Sciences. But the best prize of all is he was awarded the medal, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. I assume for being a fantastic uh, immigrant to this country. So here we go. Let's welcome Kermen Vafa telling us about puzzles. Thank you very much, Melissa, for this very kind introduction. It's a pleasure here to present my book at the Harvard, famous Harvard Bookstore. Uh, so let me share my screen. Um, so uh, I hope you see my screen here. So I'm going to talk about uh, my book, uh, which is Puzzles to Unravel the Universe. So many deep uh, ideas in physics are related to simple mathematics. And uh, there are simple truths behind deep ideas. And it is these simple truths that many scientists are interested in, in uh, crystallizing and understanding, and not so much the technical details that go with the mathematical formalism. Uh, luckily, these core ideas uh, are illustrated through simple mathematical puzzles, can be illustrated through simple mathematical puzzles, even for areas as mathematical as my field, for example, string theory. And uh, this is the aim of, uh, of, this, uh, of this book. In fact, the idea, as uh, Melissa mentioned, was uh, the motivation was to make this freshman seminar course, which brings these puzzles and introduces basic principles of physics through these simple math puzzles uh, beginning in 2012. And the course has grown organically since then with many additional puzzles that students brought to class. And recently I published uh, uh, the, the, these notes in the form of this book, Puzzles to Unravel the Universe. And so what I'm planning to do today is to share with you some of the puzzles, just a few of them, a handful of them to illustrate the flavor of it and how it connects to some of these physics principles. And uh, I hope that this will be interactive. In other words, I'm going to be posing questions and we're going to poll you for the answers. There are gonna be multiple questions like A or B or one or two. And uh, it'd be more fun to have that interaction. So that's what I'm planning to do. So uh, the first topic I wanna to talk about is the notion of symmetry and conservation laws. So symmetry, you know, you have this notion of symmetry, what the symmetric object looks like and what symmetry is. And it turns out symmetry is a very powerful and important concept in physics. And you might think that, you know, symmetry is nice and pretty and all that, but it's a little, you might think perhaps boring. And uh, what can you learn from symmetry? And here I want to illustrate the, the power of symmetry through this simple puzzle. So here's my first puzzle. Um, we have two containers, one full of green paint and the other one full of white paint. We take a small cup and fill it with the green paint and pour it into the white paint container. And then we stir it, uh, the, the container, the white paint container, and uh, we take the same size cup. Uh, and now from the mixture, we pour back the same amount of uh, paint back into the purely green paint. And we also stir it. So that is what we just did. And now that it's there very well. Okay, and then what we want to know is uh, which container has the higher concentration of the other color. In other words, does the green container have more white in it or white container has more green paint in it? And I would like you to answer the poll if possible. So I'll wait till you answer the poll. So let's wait to see what the answer would be. Okay. Let's see if the answer is out. Uh, so let's see if the, there is an answer for it. Yes. So the answer is the white green contains uh, more green paint is the majority set. And uh, the, uh, this is actually a natural answer to give for the following reason. Uh, you see the white paint was pure white and then you took the pure green paint and you poured it into the white paint. So you, when you brought the, the, the container, when you, when you added the, 
the white, the green content, it was pure green. But when you brought it back, it was mixed. So there was pure green transported to the white paint, but mixture transported back to the green. So therefore you would think that the green one, the white one has more green in it than the green has the white in it. That's kind of natural expectation. Uh, well, I didn't give you the third option, which is the, actually the correct option. The correct option is that actually they have the same amount of, uh, of, uh, of mixture. In other words, the white has the same amount of green uh, and green has the same amount of the white in it. And the reason is symmetry. So the symmetry in this case is that you start with equal amount of fluid. So the left and the right containers have the exact same amount of fluid. One is green, one is white. So you have the same amount of green, the same amount of white. At the end, when you went back and forth with this cup, at the end, the total volume that you ended up is the same because whatever you, total volume of whatever you put in, you brought back. So the total volume of the green at the beginning and at the end are the same. So there's some amount of green missing because that's, that amount is in the white. But the volume of the white and the green at the beginning and at the end are the same. So therefore, whatever is missing in one must be in the other and vice versa. In other words, if you kind of, do, the, uh, do this, uh, if you go, for example, by, by trying to do the admixture and try to unmix them. So therefore, uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see, uh, so, so you try, just imagine you're unmixing them, then the same amount of white, which is in green, must be the same amount that is the other one. So if you transpose them back to where they are, of course, you go back to the original situation. So they have exactly the same amount of, of mixture. So the symmetry is powerful as the simple example illustrate. So symmetries are powerful and they're deeply related to conservation laws in physics. Conservations of momentum, the energy and all that are related to symmetries. The next concept that I want to discuss is spontaneous symmetry breaking. So symmetries are very, very important but breaking them, it turns out to be even more interesting and more important for us. So I will illustrate this with another puzzle. So this is the next puzzle. We have four cities, A, B, C, and D, on the four corners of a square. And uh, we are trying to build the highway system which connects all the four cities together. We would like to know what is the shortest highway system we can construct which connects all the cities together you don't have to directly go from any city to every other city, as long as there's a way from any city to get to any other city through the highway system, that's fine. So we want to find the, the shortest highway system which connects every city to every other one, one way or the other. So here's the first question. Uh, how many of you think that this is the best route, the best highway system? So yes or no, if you could please, uh, Give an answer, that would be great. Okay, so so most of you say no and uh, and that is correct. How about the next one? Let's go, go to the next one, which is uh, how about how about if you uh, if you just uh, go to this configuration or this one, either of these two. Let's, well, clearly this one is not the answer. So the question would be whether or not if you go to the next one, this one would be because you can certainly change the number of you can remove one of the edges and still be the same. Is this the answer? How many think this is the best route? Okay, so again, majority correctly say this is not the best one. And so it turns out indeed the best route is this one. The best, best highway system is this one. And it is surprising. It is surprising because the, it, the, the highway system does not share the symmet all the symmetries of the square. You see, if you were lived in the, 
in the city A and you wanted to get to city B versus city C, you might have thought that since they are equidistant from A, you should have the same time to get from A to C versus A to B. But the highway system, which gives the shortest path between them, does not respect that symmetry. Namely, if you want to get to, from A to C, it is shorter than from A to B. And so this turns out to be the shortest uh, highway system you can construct. There's another way you can construct it by going from A to B first and then coming down and going from C to D. But either one of them does not enjoy the full symmetries of the square. So this, in other words, the minimum, minimum highway distance breaks the symmetry spontaneously. We started the situation where the square has a certain symmetry, but our answer does not enjoy all the symmetries of the, of the square. Now, the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking actually is not that new. It has been known for many, many, uh, not only centuries, many millennia. In fact, the early Greek philosophers already discovered it in the following form. So they had already, they were really, really smart. They had already appreciated that the earth is round and it's at the, they thought it's at the center of the universe. And they had noticed it's not moving, but they wanted to have an argument why the earth is not moving. They had found its sphere, uh, but they didn't know why it's not moving around. And so to try to come up with an explanation, they, they said, well, what happens if, if you think about the earth as moving somewhere? If you move somewhere, like this, then you're breaking the spherical symmetry. In other words, before it moved, you had the spherical symmetry. Every direction was equally good. As soon as you move in some direction, you're picking a direction, you're breaking that symmetry. And they said, you're not allowed to break symmetry. So they tried to explain why the earth is not moving uh, by trying to use the principle that symmetry is prevented from moving. You cannot break symmetry. So, but they were very sophisticated and Aristotle did not accept this argument. He said, this is not a good argument because he argued you could break symmetries and he tried to explain what does, how could you naturally spontaneously break the symmetry? And he argued as follows. He said, suppose you have a person at the center of a circle and you distribute uh, food, like let's say loaves of bread on a circle uh, whose center is the person standing in the middle and you ask whether the person is going to move or not. Is the person going to move and break the circle of symmetry or not? Or is it going to stay in the center? Of course the person is going to move because the person is going to starve otherwise. So it's going to move at some point. Doesn't care about symmetries if it gets broken because it's, it's a better outcome, get the food. So the, bre the breaking of the symmetry can be done or will be done if there is a good reason for it. And this is an example of it similar to what happened in the highway system. So the highway system is an example of it. Now, you might think that these are esoteric examples, but actually there are much more natural examples. Look at your own face. Your own face has two eyes, but you see, we, we live on a situation, on an environment, which is naturally 360 degree rotation symmetry. If it was that, why did, I, why, why did our body choose the eyes in the front? We should have had eyes all over in a circular way, right? Like this one, because that would be more symmetrical. So spontaneous symmetry breaking is in fact imprinted on our body. So our eyes are in the front because evolution has decided it's the more efficient way to make use of its resources because what we really need is to go after the food after all. So we need to know where is the food and we're going in that direction. So the eyes in the front are more important than all over the head. And so therefore that's what it chooses. So spontaneous symmetry breaking is a very natural phenomenon and happens again and again. And it's very frequently seen in different contexts in physics. So for example, uh, the applications on physics is enormous. One example is the origin of mass. The fact that we have masses is related to the fact that symmetry has to get broken. Fundamental laws of physics show that if symmetry was not broken, we would have no mass, we would be massless, like, like, like photon, which is traveling through the space with no mass, with speed of light, we would have been going with the speed of light if it wasn't for the fact that symmetry has gotten broken. And the manifestation of it is the discovery of Higgs particle that Melissa and the, uh, the friends discovered in the Large Hadron Collider in a few years ago. So this is an example of origin of mass as an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Another example is, uh, we have more matter, we have matter around us, but not antimatter. 
Naively, you might have thought there's a symmetry, but again, the symmetry gets broken. Magnets, these cool things, you know, they have these uh, magnetic fields in some direction, exist because of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Another cool example is superconductors. Again, manifestation of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So symmetry breaking is also cool and is quite, quite crucial for many different physical phenomena. Now, just to illustrate that math is a lot of fun and you might think that the more abstract and more complicated the math is, the more fun and that's not necessarily so. In fact, sometimes very simple, almost trivial math could be amazing and, and powerful. So let me give you some examples of it. Consider the earth and the equator and consider, uh, suppose we have a belt, a big belt, and we wrap it all the way around the equator. And this belt we open up, and uh, so it was originally wrapped tightly around the equator, we open it up, we add one meter to the belt, like that, and then we wrap it again around the uh, equator. Of course, now it won't be tight anymore. It will stand a little bit uh, above the equator. So the question is, how much does it stand above the equator? So, uh, so in other words, suppose you have this, this, this rises somewhat, and I want to have a question to you, a poll to you. If I try to pass an object under the belt, uh, do you think this object can pass through, if it's less than a millimeter, between a millimeter and a centimeter, or between a centimeter and one meter? Which one of these three you think is the right one. <clears throat> okay, let's see what the answer is. So, Majority of you say it's between one centimeter and one meter. Amazing. That is the correct answer indeed. And it was not the answer I would have expected myself uh, to be given. I would have thought it's much less than a millimeter naively. And the reason you would think that is that you would think that the, you know, the belt is extremely, uh, the equator is extremely big. So that original belt is huge and tiny one meter adding to doesn't do much. And so you might think that if you put it back on the earth is just like a you know, micron or some tiny, tiny scale up. And indeed, as majority of you correctly said, it's between one centimeter and one meter. In fact, if you want to uh, see what it is, it's a simple, simple math. Simple math is simply the following. You just, uh, you just uh, consider the circumference, original circumference was two pi r and you add one meter and you want two pi times the next radius, which is the radius plus how much it's gotten bigger. So from this simple algebra, you find that two pi x is one or x is one over two pi, which is uh, 0.16 meters, or in other words, 16 centimeters. So indeed it's between, uh, between a centimeter and a meter. However, uh, I presented this puzzle to my class and one of the students came back and told me I got a different answer. I said, how could you? This is simple math. I mean, why did you get a different answer? And this, the student said that, well, uh, you didn't say that uh, I should put the belt uniformly around the equator. I could, for example, push one side up a little further up. Uh, like push it, push it one way on the right and then wrap it tightly around the rest of it. So I said, okay, so, so what do you get? He said, well, I got 121 meters if I do that. So 121 meters, if you do that, it's naively just, you know, it's just you have added one meter, but you're saying it rises 121 meter. Indeed, the student was correct. It rises 121 meters. And this one is less intuitive. This one needs a little bit of a detailed calculation, but it shows the ideas, simple ideas that sometimes work in simple setup could have amazing extensions, which are very non-trivial looking like this one. The, the, the height that it rises is not like half a meter or a meter, it's about 121 meters, very surprising. Another example of power of mathematics is the idea of continuity. Physical laws are, you know, set of equations that we typically have, and these equations are, have solutions which are typically continuous. So 
the laws of physics give results which are continuous. Things vary gradually and continuously. So that is a typical situation and I want to illustrate it with the power of this idea of continuity with one puzzle. Consider again the earth and consider the equator. I love the equator. And suppose we, we want to uh, measure the temperature around the equator. Could it be that there are two points exactly diametrically opposite on the equator, diametrically opposite relative to the center of the earth, which have the same temperature? Could it be like, for example, this point and that point have the same temperature? Well, it turns out not only there is such a point that they have the same temperature, there always is such a point. No matter what temperature you have on the equators, on the equator, as long as the temperature varies continuously, it turns out there are at least, at least two points diametrically opposite with exactly the same temperature. Now, you might think that this follows from some probably deep pro property of you know, thermodynamics or you know, atmosphere or whatnot, but it just has to do with the fact that I'm assuming the temperature varies continuously on the equator. And to see that, you just consider the temperature on the two opposite points. Let me denote the opposite points by plus and minus. Suppose the temperature and the opposite points are not the same. Well, let's consider the difference between them. Let me call that function F. So if you take the temperature and the opposite point and take their difference, if F was zero, then that's the point where they have the same temperature. So suppose F is not zero, but if I go from theta, if I move around the equator from one point theta to the opposite point, then this function goes to minus itself because whatever, if this one, if this temperature over here is bigger than the other one, if I go to the other side, this one is gonna be higher. So the sign flips. In other words, this function flips after you go to the other side, which means that if I start with some value, if it was, let's say negative, and the other side is exactly the minus of it, which is be positive. But since this function is a continuous function, if it goes from a negative value to a positive value, at some point, it will be zero. At the point that it is zero, it will be a point where the temperatures are equal. And so that would be a proof that there will be such, such points in the air. Slightly more interesting ex extension of it shows that not only uh, there are points which have the same temperature, but if you look at not just on the equator, but on the earth, there are always two points, at least two points, diametrically opposite on the Earth, which have exactly the same temperature and pressure. Again, something that you might have ascribed to some deep aspects of physics simply follows from continuity. So another example, which I want to talk about, is gravitational lensing. And how it works as an, another example of the power of continuity. So first I have to tell you what is gravitational lensing. So Einstein's theory uh, basically tells you that uh, the geometry, the fabric of space is kind of curved and depending on what objects are where, the, the, the curvature changes. So the fact that this, the, the space is curved, it means that if you have light rays passing nearby uh, massive objects like galaxies or whatnot, the light does not go straight. If it wants to go the shortest path, but the space is kind of curved, so therefore it takes a, a, what would be a straight path looks like bent. And if so, it is possible that a given light, a given star emits two different lights, which gets to us from two different paths because of the fact that the light kind of bends. And this is the situation which is called the gravitational lensing. We can get multiple images uh, of a given object through this lensing phenomenon. So for example, this is, a, this is an actual example of a, of a picture of a sky. In this picture, you, you see that there are, uh, there are uh, objects here. They look like various kinds of galaxies or whatnot. And it turns out actually in that circle, these five uh, blue circles are circled around the same quasar. So these five objects here are actually the same objects. Same object, the light is getting to us from different paths and it fools us to think that they're the same object. And these three orange circled objects are the same galaxy. So the, the path that the light takes from these galaxies are different and we think they're actually different, but actually they're the same galaxy. So you see you have three images here and five images here. Okay, now what does this have to do with puzzles? Uh, well, it turns out that this is a, an amazing fact that the number of images that we get 
if no image is blocked, of course, somebody could block one of the images. If you don't block any of the images, is always odd. The number of images is odd. Like the one we just saw, three images or five images or one image. And exactly less than half of them are inverted. So if you have, for example, three images, you have one image which is inverted and two which is not inverted. And if you have five, you have two inverted one and three, uh, three of them which are not. So why is that? Well, this actually has to do with a slightly more uh, abstract concept in math called the degree of a map. And the degree of a map, which is, not, is, is a number of pre-images of a given point when you have a map from one space to another. So, so you count the number of points and that concept, that object, it does not change when you change the things around it. So the number of pre-images doesn't change. Actually, not exactly right. The number of pre-images, maybe the number of points that get mapped to a given point, doesn't change if you count them with a plus or minus sign, depending on whether the orientation of the map is changing near one point or another. So to illustrate it, it's easiest to do it with a picture. So here, you have a picture of the Earth, trying to look at the image of a star, and you see there's one light path which crosses here at one point. Here, it crosses at three different points of this boundary of this star, which you would naturally think there are three images, and over here, you get five images. So you see that if you go around the circle, you get a map from all these five points mapping to one point, but the orientation is reversing because as you go around this, you go up here, but then down here, and then up here, and then down here, and so forth. So these three of them, which are going in the right direction, give you an upside image, right side up image, and the other two give you inverted images. And this is illustrated of the fact that the net number of images here is three minus two, which is plus one, which was the same as what we originally started with. Namely, if you start here from the original one, it was the same number as, uh, as, uh, as plus one, which is the first one we started with. The next example is uh, that I want to discuss, and the next concept I want to discuss is the notion of duality and the physical laws. Duality is one of the basic discoveries that we have made in physics, especially in the past uh, three decades. It's one of the driving principles of many areas of physics and in particular of string theory. And it is, perhaps best illustrated with this beautiful drawing of Escher. Um, the duality here is in this case illustrated by the fact that even though you have a single drawing, uh, different parts of the drawing give you a completely different image of what's going on. For example, on one side, you think about uh, your, it's a day and then you have flying birds, black birds going to the left. On the other side, you're having a black, uh, dark sky, it's a night, and then you have a white bird flying to the right. And similarly, uh, these birds, as you go from up to down, they become fields of white and black fields down here. So this duality transformation converts this black bird on this side becomes part of the sky gradually when you trace what's happening. And this white bird here emerges from the sky. So there's this duality transformation. One, thing, one object on one side becomes something else. And the whole thing fits beautifully into one picture, but the objects change their roles. And this happens again and again in modern physics, that objects somehow play a different role and you have to change the orientation of how you think about them to appreciate the symmetry between, between the fact that these two parts are actually of the same drawing. So here I'm going to illustrate it by, by one puzzle. So the puzzle is going to have a, a number of ants crawling on a meter stick. And when the ants collide, on the, the ants are going with the constant speed on the meter stick. The meter stick is one meter long. And when they collide, they just reverse orient direction and go backwards. So the, whenever two ants collide, they, they just change direction and go back until they collide with another ant and then they go back again. So basically a picture like this. So for example, you see this, this orange one hits the blue one and then turns back and so forth. It's one meter long. So unfortunately, when the ants get to the end, they will fall off the meter stick. So at the end, there would be no, uh, there would be no ants left. And so the puzzle is the following. Suppose you have 20 ants and you have one meter stick and uh, the ants are going at the constant speed of one centimeter per second. Where do you put the ants and which directions should, you, should they initially move so as to maximize the time that the last ant is on the meter stick? Now, uh, one might naively think that you would want to put them all bunched up near the middle somewhere 
so that they will collide with each other back and forth so that will lengthen the time they are on the meter stick because of these collisions. The collisions could help you keep the ants going back and forth, back and forth for a long time. But actually it turns out that the answer is much simpler and the answer can be seen just from a duality transformation, changing our perspective. And so the duality transformation that we do is, you see what we said here is that when the ants move, they change, they change direction when they collide. But if you're not caring about the identity of the ants, if you're just interested in which ant, not which ant, but whether there's an ant on the meter stick, you don't care about the identity of the ant. So you might as well color all of them black. And if you color all of them black, then guess what happens? Then you don't even, when they collide and they go back, you can't even know if they go back or they're just going through each other. So there's no difference whether they're colliding and going and going back in different direction or just going through each other. Therefore, the answer is simply, you put one ant on the left-hand side of the meter stick and then instruct the ant to go to the right. And then it takes 100 seconds for it to get to the other one. And that's the best answer. No matter what you do, that's the, that's the answer that's gonna give you the longest for the time for the ant to be on the meter stick. So this illustrates the idea that, uh, you know, a simple change of perspective, in this case, a duality transformation between the identity of the ants gives you a, a, a simple answer of what, what the puzzle is. So finally, as my last puzzle, uh, it's one of my favorite puzzles, is, uh, is actually what we always do in, in, in science. Namely, uh, what is the scientific methodology? How can you illustrate the scientific methodology with a simple puzzle? And this last puzzle does that. So uh, what do we do? We start with an example or examples or what we call examples or experiments. So we look at experiments and we, after a few of the experiments we observe, we formulate a general principle on the basis of examples. So we, we see these examples, we say, ah, this is what's happening. And once we understand what's happening and we have these principles, we try to explain why these principles hold. What are the reasons that, 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 that the things work the way they do? But we don't stop, we never stop. And we ask our experimentalist, experimentalist, experimentalist colleagues, Melissa in particular in this case, to do further experiments and check whether we have made any mistakes. The more experiments we do, the more sure we could be whether we got it right or whether we got it wrong. So here goes the example. We have a circle and uh, here the green circle here. And what are we going to do? We are going to choose some points, random points on a circle. So take two points on the circle and connect them with the line. So the question is, if I have two points on a circle, how many regions do I get inside the circle? Well, in this case, it's kind of clearly two. So if I have, in other words, two points, I get two regions inside the circle. Now I take, suppose I add one more point. So now I have three points and I add every point to every other point. And then I ask, how many regions do I get inside the circle? Well, as you can actually uh, check it, it's just four regions. One, two, three, four. So, so you get the three, four regions here. So, so three points give you four regions. Next, you do five points. So if you do five points, you get, uh, let's count it again, five points, you get eight regions. Okay, so that's good. So what, one more point. So you're beginning to see a pattern, right? Each time you're going down with a number of points, something is happening with the number of regions. So let's do one more just to get really the, the feel for it. So if you do one more, this is five points, get a little crowded. So if you do the counting uh, as we have done here, you see indeed it's 16. So what's happened is that each time you add a point, you see what happens to the number of regions. Okay, so now that you have gotten the idea, I'm going to raise the next question. I'm going to add one more point. So if I have six points, how many regions do are, are we going to get? So I'm going to pause, pose it as a question to you. So let's pull that. Do we get 32 regions, 64 regions, or neither of the two?
Exactly. So most of you said 32 is the answer. And 32 is natural uh, as a natural guess because each time you see you're getting double. Two goes to four, four goes to eight, eight goes to 16. So it's natural to expect that 16 should go to 32. So let's see if that's actually the case. Um, so you add one more point. Sorry, before we do this, before we add one more point, there's a theory why it should be a factor of two. So the idea is this, if you just get two points connected to line, each region is either to the left or to the right of that region. So you get a factor of two just by counting whether the regions are on the left and the right. And so therefore you also have a theory. The theory says not only is a factor of two, the explanation is obvious, quote unquote, which is you get the left or right of each region, count the factor of two, and therefore you're gonna get a factor of two each time. So you add one more point, and then you look at how many points you get, how many regions you get, and if you count it carefully, uh, hopefully I haven't missed any, but you see that the biggest number I get here is 31. So indeed, the prediction is not 32, it's actually 31, and that's a big surprise. So this is the analog of doing more experiments and finding out that, you know, after all, our theory was wrong, and we have to come up with a better theory to try to explain what the actual experiment is telling us. So we then search and try to figure out what was our mistake, how were we, why were we fooled by these experiments to, to think it's, it has to be 32. And, and then once one figures out the exact formula, which I don't bother explaining why, you get an explicit formula and in fact gives you 31 as the right answer. And the next one, for example, would have been instead of 64 to be 57, for example. So let me, uh, let me basically end here by saying that I hope I have conveyed uh, the power of simple mathematical ideas in the context of physics. There are many more examples in the book, about 100 or so. And the, the main thing is that even the most advanced ideas in physics could, have, could be illustrated by some fun, simple mathematical puzzles. And I'm uh, thankful that you listened to my talk today. Thank you very much. So let me stop sharing my screen and I will take questions. Okay, so um, if the questions are in the question and answers, so I will look at the questions. In the green and white paint example, are you absolutely sure that mixing is necessary? In fact, it's unnecessary, good observation. There's no necessity for, for mixing and I was just trying to kind of make it more complicated. If it wasn't mixed, it would have been very easy to say it because then it would be on the top layer and then you put it back, the top layer will go back from the right to the left. It doesn't matter whether you mix it or not. So that's a good point. Okay, so uh, where do the extra 120 meters come from? That's the question about the equator and the belt wrapped around the equator. Why do we get 120 meters? It is not easy to explain it. It's just that you're pulling one side. It, it is... The, the, roughly the idea is that the earth is so big that the other part is basically squeezing the area out from the, all the other sides and pushing them one side. In other words, when it was equally distributed around the earth, you had the band around the earth, which is this extra area that the belt covers. So by squeezing that area all to one side, you're squeezing it a lot, pushing them one side and that causes it to rise. But to actually get 120 meters, I don't have any easy way of doing it other than actually doing the math, which involves a little bit of, of a technical uh, calculation, which I which is described in the book, but it's a bit too technical to describe it here. So let's go to the next question. Are there examples of actual places on the earth where there actually are two points where the temperature is the same? Does it have to be at the same time as well? The statement is yes, at any moment, at any moment on the earth, even right now, there are at least two points on the equator which have the same temperature, which are diametrically opposite relative to the center of the earth. This just follows from continuity of temperature. That's so amazing. So just imagine like you open up the, 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 the TV and listen to the news and they, somebody says, you know, amazingly today, it was observed that at any time, people who measured the temperature and pressure across the earth, they, they found that there are always at least two points which have exactly the same temperature and pressure, diametrically opposite relative to the center of the earth. And this is a remarkable fact. Well, not really, it just follows from continuity of, of the physics. And that's the kind of power that math brings in, which kind of clarifies what's going on. So we go to the next question. 
what is the meaning of the sine curve? I'm not sure which curve are we referring to. Um, let me see. I Sorry. believe they were talking about the puzzle with the pictures of the different galaxies in it, but I could be wrong. Oh, the, this, the galaxies. Yeah, so yeah. the different galaxies, uh, the, the orange color and the blue color, you mean, that those are the ones? You were talking about the quasars and galaxies. Is that what the question was? I, that's what I'm guessing so, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the, this is just the, we're just circling them to just isolate what, what, the, what the quasars, where the quasars are and where the galaxies are. Quasars are the centers of galaxies which, have, which are supermassive black holes and they include you know, infalling uh, uh, objects, infalling gas and all that, which heats up and glows and you get, you get all these uh, light coming out of them. They're very powerful emission of light there. And, uh, and that was the images that, that was shown over there. In fact, uh, today you may have heard the announcement for Nobel Prize in Physics awarded for, the, uh, for black holes and the observational aspect as well as theoretical predictions of it. It's a, it's a very well-deserved uh, prize. Uh, oh, okay. I'm so sorry. The person who asked that question um, just confirmed they were talking about the gravitational lensing graphic. Yes, that's, yes. The... that's the one we okay. just talked. Exactly. Very good. Okay, so we go to the next question. Do you think we will have a generally accepted theory of quantum gravity in any of our lifetime? I think I would say that uh, I think string theory is a generally accepted theory of quantum gravity. And so what, what uh, Melissa perhaps was referring to is that we don't have a deep understanding of what string theory actually means. That's, in other words, even though we, we, we see the facets of uh, string theory give rise to a consistent quantum gravity, we haven't deeply understood all the aspects of the theory. So, so if, you're, if you're question, so I interpret your question by saying, when will we deeply understand what string theory is all about? And I would say that uh, it's, 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 uh, it's not clear when we will figure it out exactly, but we have already made quite a lot of breakthroughs in, in, in my lifetime. And I think that it might go a few more generations. I do not know, but it's quite, quite remarkable journey so far. And uh, uh, in fact, you might think that the longer it is, the more we're going to learn about deep, deep and cool things about our universe. So I don't have a definite prediction other than the fact that we are always deepening our understanding of what quantum gravity is. So somebody asks, Dick asks, could you give a formal definition of symmetry? And indeed, yes, there is a formal definition of symmetry. Symmetry is defined to be uh, doing it in a physical sense. You do an operation on your physical system. And after you do some operation, it leaves it intact. So, so, so that's what symmetry is. So for example, if you have a straight line with nothing on it, if you move from one point to another, nothing has changed. That's called the symmetry. So that's called translational symmetry. Or if you move in time from one day to the other, if, if nothing is specifically happening at a given particular day, it's, it's, the time is a, shifting the time is a symmetry. Or if you're talking about, you know, a triangle, an equilateral triangle, you have reflection symmetries. When you do reflections, the triangle goes back to itself and so forth, or rotations in that case. Okay, so that's the definition of symmetry. So uh, symmetries imply conservation laws, which is one, one deep aspect of physics, which is not a priori obvious. So, uh, so there's a question, besides the examples you have shared today, do you have a favorite puzzle to teach one, uh, to teach or one you have found particularly helpful in breaking down a complicated concept? Oh, there are many such puzzles. And there are, as I said, about a hundred or so puzzles in the book. All of them are, are cool stuff. I would encourage you to look at them. I don't want to pick a particular one. I just, it's just samples here just to give you an illustration. I would recommend it to look at it. Um, so let's go to the next one. Does all laws of physics relate to symmetry laws and or possible symmetry breaking? So that's by Dawood Norouzi. The physical laws, uh, they do not all relate to symmetries. Uh, symmetries are aspect of physical laws, but not the only aspect of physical laws. So, so symmetry and symmetry breaking are a facet of physical laws, but not the only aspect of them. This is a question that comes from Behrouz. I guess my brother is watching it. He's asking me a question. Temperature puzzle, fine and flow, follow, but how, how about pressure and temperature puzzle? Is there a formula? So the temperature and pressure puzzle is not too difficult and it's similar to the temperature puzzle if you want to explain why the temperature and pressure on the opposite points of the earth uh, are the same. You, you construct another function. In this case, it would be a 
uh, instead of a function which had previously we had taken a temperature minus the opposite temperature, you take temperature and pressure and minus the opposite temperature and pressure. And in this case, you get a, what we call a vector function. And you study this vector function. And again, this is illustrated in my book. And you use winding uh, of, of this vector around the circle. And you find that the winding number of that circle has to be odd. And that would be a contradiction if it wasn't for the fact that there would be uh, two points where have the same temperature and pressure. So the detailed explanation is in the book. Uh, the Abunuruzi asks, is physical reality a manifestation of self-consistent math? This is a good question. I don't have a deep answer. Of course, physical reality should be self-consistent. Whether or not it should be, a, a, so that aspect is kind of clear. Why, why math is so much prominent in physical reality, why math shows up all the time is not completely clear. Of course, math by, by itself, I would interpret math as self-consistent logical structure. So if you interpret math more generally and more broadly, as saying whatever is self-consistent is math, is a piece of math, then yes, the physical reality will always be described by self-consistent math. Um, but, but we still don't have a deep understanding of why math is so powerful in describing physical reality. Next question is some events occurred and exist in the past. Where does the past go? How, do you, how, do, how to find the past? Well, the past in some sense is, is present. Uh, an illustration of the past being present is the fact that the light that we see of the Big Bang today is the Big Bang, the beginning of the explosion of the uh, of the universe giving rise to our universe. We still are seeing the afterglow. So in some sense, it exists even today in the sense that the light goes around. Now, you might say there are some processes which ended. What about those processes? So the laws of physics, in some sense, have a formulation which we look at the continuum of space and time. And it's natural to include time in that way of thinking about it. So we think about space and time together in that context. So, so the answer to that question would be that time doesn't go anywhere, it's there. Uh, but perhaps the question is, why do we perceive as if it's gone? And that's a good question. I don't have a good answer to that question. Why is it that our perception is such that the past is past? And uh, of course, one deep aspect of it is related to the following uh, fact in physics, what's called causality. The things in the past affect things in the future, but not vice versa. So in other words, you, can, you, can, uh, you cannot go back in time in that sense. So there's, a, there's a direction of the arrow of time, and that's kind of related to the, our perception of time the way we do, but still does not have a deep explanation of why we forget about the past in some sense. Um, uh, there is a, there's a part of it discussed in my, um, well, Maybe, maybe that's too far afield to describe. So let me just uh, stop with that answer. So let's go back to the next question. The question about the galaxies referred to the next slide. Where there, where there was a curve that is straight across the, yes. So three times or five times. Right, so the question about the galaxies. Right, okay, so this was the question that was asked. I think I was showing you that when you were trying to describe it, um, I was trying to describe for you what is the degree of a, a map means, which by trying to illustrate that winding of that circle near the, near, the, um, near the star, the actual physics is not quite that circle that I drew. I was just illustrating with a mathematical picture for the degree of the map. Okay, uh, the next question, does the number of regions in the endpoint on a circle puzzle assume that each intersection has only two lines? Yes, good point. I was assuming generic points on the boundary. So I'm talking about generic. You can, of course, choose special points on the circle so they will cross at the same point. So I was, I was assuming uh, generically positioned points, so the random points, so that indeed uh, the three lines don't cross from the same point. Exactly. Thank you for the clarification. That was by Glenn. Next one is, the, can, can you square the definition of continuity with the theory of multiverse? Uh, well, Continuity is there in the physical laws and multiverses seem to be there in the sense that we have many universes that are consistent in the definition of string theory. Uh, there are different definitions of what we mean by multiverse, but, uh, but in general, they're two separate concepts a priori. So, so continuity has no contradiction with multiverse. So we go to the next question. What, are, what area of experimental physics research are you most excited for? question actually I'm myself interested in these days on cosmological questions uh, both the early as well as the 
great late time cosmology. So this question by Brody, actually I, I like a lot because one of the deep puzzles about our universe today is that we, we seem to have dark energy and the dark energy is some energy which permeates the whole space and its value is positive. And this was measured a couple of decades ago. It's one of the amazing discoveries. And because of this dark energy, the, the acceleration of the big bang is actually accelerating even further. And the question is, what is the nature of this dark energy and so forth? And it turns out that the, the nature of this dark energy is changing potentially over time. And so some of these ideas from string theory that I've been working on actually suggest that the dark energy is not a constant and actually can change over time and indeed should go down over time. So this observational impact of such a thing would be quite amazing if we can see this in, 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 uh, in, in by, by seeing if whether the acceleration of the universe is changing over time in recent, in recent epoch or not, and that would be extremely interesting. So that's one of the areas I'm interested in, cosmology. Thank you for the question. And one question by Norris, uh, is there any plan to translate this book into other languages, for example, Spanish? There are so many low-income students uh, which have no access to this type of information in a way that is accessible to them. Have you considered working with your colleagues at the university, uh, education or new development, or to extend the reach of this fine work with programs such as migrant programs nationally? Excellent question, Norris. That I would love to have a possibility of translating this book to different languages. Um, uh, I wish I knew Spanish to do it, but I don't. So at any rate, I think that it would be great to have this translated and uh, perhaps I should find uh, people who would be interested in doing this and I welcome anyone who's interested in doing it. Thanks for the question and thanks everybody for, for listening to our, our discussions as well as the question and answers. Uh, I enjoyed the discussions and the questions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming and thank you so much Cameron for this fantastic presentation and thanks to Melissa Franklin for that wonderful introduction. Um, please learn more about this fascinating book and purchase puzzles to unravel the universe at harvard.com and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library all here in Cambridge Mass. Have a good night, keep reading and be well. Thank you so much guys. Thank you. <laughs>